summer break. So do you want cheese on that, hon? Sure, bye. A time for leisure, recreation, and taking her easy. Unless you're me. I'm just watching Gravity Falls again. God, 10 years. 8 since I started actually watching the show. But yeah, Gravity Falls officially turns 10 this month. It's no secret to viewers of this channel that this show means a lot to me. It means a lot to millions of people actually. Through all the mysteries and eldritch horrors, Alex Hirsch's beloved kids cartoon was a show that profoundly impacted many. Even beyond that, I'd go as far as to call it one of the most important cartoons of its time, and helped establish the early 2010s as a new semi-renaissance for animation. It was a show anyone of any age could sit down and watch without feeling alienated or pandered to. It struck the perfect balance of entertainment for kids and entertainment for adults, and most importantly, told a timeless story about growing up in general, and its impact is still felt throughout the industry today, with its spirit being present in many of the newer and still really good plot-driven Disney shows that have since taken its place, like Amphibia and The Owl House. There was a culture to fall in Gravity Falls as it was airing that other cartoons couldn't even touch. It was a show that thrived on its mysteries, and entrusted its viewers to crack all of the secret codes at the end of every episode, all of the codes hidden within episodes, etc. The number of theories produced as the fan base, as part of their major investment in the world and its characters, desperately tried to think one step ahead of the show's writers and predict what could possibly happen next. It's not something exclusive to Gravity Falls' fan base, but there was really nothing quite like the community that the show had garnered. The show actively toyed with people, playing into the theorizers in its audience. It was telling its story near flawlessly with its limited amount of episodes, while simultaneously giving the fandom a wealth of food for thought, and moments with so many possible implications to theorize about, with just one new episode. And this is all pertaining to the show's lore and the secret secrets, not even mentioning the big questions of the story that would act as one of the main reasons why the show remained as popular as it was. What is Stan hiding? Who is Bill Cipher? Who wrote the journals? These were massive story hooks with answers that were planned far ahead of time, whereas some shows these days may write their stories as they go along with little planning, often resulting in the plot feeling rushed, undercooked, and unsatisfying. Gravity Falls was probably planned from the very beginning. It has an ending. It ties up the vast majority of its loose ends in a satisfying and rewarding way. If you search Gravity Falls Fury on Google or YouTube, you will be traveling down one of the deepest rabbit holes of online fandom discussion in recent memory. Nothing compares to it. Even after the show ended, fans showed their sheer dedication, passion, and love for the show and what it had created with the now well-known Cypher Hunt. But that's a whole can of worms in and of itself that has been covered a lot. Rest assured though, this sheer amount of planning and overall thought that went into this hunt helped to reinforce the show's legacy as something much more than a simple kids show, and its mere existence is proof of just how much the show impacted so many people and kept them engaged with its mysteries. Even ignoring the mysteries of the show and watching it as a piece of entertainment, the writing was exceptionally sharp, with the number of adult jokes almost rivaling the number of family-friendly ones, making a very well-rounded viewing experience. And outside of the joke department, setup and payoff was something Gravity Falls had mastered. It competently introduced the crux of the problem for the episode, carefully built up toward a more action-oriented climax, and delivered a satisfying payoff. It sounds like storytelling fundamentals, but the show was consistent with making each episode, even the weaker ones, satisfying. It's very telling that when the weakest episode of a show is still considered good when held up to the standards of televised storytelling, it's safe to say the writers know what they're doing and are exceptionally good at it. Heck, even towards the finale of the series, where they're running out of episodes quickly and you think they might just buckle under the weight of expectations, the show somehow manages to make each plot revelation feel natural and satisfying, despite being somewhat rushed. But above all else, above the well-written plot, the sharp wit, the perfect story hooks and mysteries, Gravity Falls was a show about growing up, the illusion of a never-ending summer that shapes your life forever, before the illusion breaks as the days draw nearer, and you're faced with the reality that you've just experienced the last true hurrah of your childhood, as you face the world as growing teens to young adults. I could spend hours of my life gushing about every detail of this show and what it does right, and I'm doing that to an extent just considerably condensed, always a rewrite, never a save as. In celebration of this wonderful show, I intend to go in depth over what I've briefly talked about as well as what the show means to me as someone who grew up watching its painfully short, but also perfectly condensed two seasons. The genius simplicity yet compellingly complex storytelling, the ingeniously crafted mysteries that established the show's legacy, and capping it off of what this show means to me and many others as we grew up with our beloved characters. I'm probably going to get weirdly sentimental and biased, but I hope you can forgive me for that.
Gravity Falls' story, contrary to what some may think, is actually incredibly simple when you look at it at a surface level. The writers do a tremendous job of not letting the story get too sidetracked with subplots or characters outside of the main cast. The show has a lot of what some would call filler episodes, i.e. episodes that don't significantly impact the story or push the main plot forward. However, I never saw them like that. The concept of a filler episode implies that in the grand scheme of things, the episode you're watching is practically meaningless since it has little to no impact on the story, and its entire existence is because of a need to fill out the number of episodes that have been ordered by the network. It fills in space. Gravity Falls, for all intents and purposes, doesn't have filler. The vast majority of its episodes aren't concerned with the overarching story, but that doesn't mean they count as filler as they serve a different purpose. Plenty of Gravity Falls' world building and character development stems from these episodes, and I think something that goes largely unappreciated these days, I'll just blame this one on anime if you don't mind, is watching the characters establish a firm bond between each other without there having to be a life or death situation all the time. Sometimes, in the story's best interest and to make sure the big dramatic story beats have their emotional impact, it's important to show these characters enjoying life, learning important lessons, going on stupid adventures, and learning more about themselves. Season 2, Episode 8 probably didn't need to give us the backstory for Seuss, a mostly comic relief character up to this point, but they went there, going into his father's abandonment and also recontextualizing every moment in the series prior where he views Stan as a father figure. Season 2, Episode 13 could have ditched the entire plot about Dungeons and Dragons parody and focus on the brief bit of story we get at the end, but if it did that, we would have never seen Dipper and Ford become as close as they did, or realize how much they have in common, which would have severely neutered the impact of the finale and future episodes where they work together. Hell, you can pick up basically every non-story important episode and see that while not all of them have the most compelling character development, they all share the same purpose of creating believable characters with believable relationships. It's just fun to watch these characters go on goofy adventures a lot instead of being constantly tortured. It's those disconnected episodes episodes that grant the very best of the show's catalogue the emotional impact they require. When someone asks me, hey I want to get into Gravity Falls, can you list all the filler episodes I should avoid, I feel just a little bit of pain inside. You'd be missing out on so many golden episodes if you did that, but you'd also be missing the crucial context that allows the show to become as great as it is. And just because these episodes don't directly influence the plot doesn't mean they have no value. As said, secret messages. We'll tackle that soon. However, even though these non-story focused episodes are great, it is valid to critique the show for having a few of them be bunched up in the final stretch of the show, something I and many people have given shows like Star vs. the Forces of Evil shit for. These episodes aren't bad by any means, Stantia and Candida is incredibly funny, and it's not like their inclusion negatively impacted the show's final episodes, but you can definitely feel the weight of everything the show has built up being balanced extremely carefully over 20 minutes, and I think it would have been smarter to spend more time on the main plot towards the ending. Outside of the filler episodes though, Gravity Falls is a fantastic main plot. It's brilliant in the sense that, despite being seemingly complex and there's plenty of implied lore, none of it is actually a required reading, nor does it need to be completely understood to get what's going on. I actually own the real life journal free that was on sale a few years ago, and the amount of lore and extra content that is held within this thing is insane. It certainly enhances the show when you rewatch it, but it's not required that you understand all of it. All of these pieces of world building scattered throughout the show, like the dinosaurs underground, the entire valley of Gravity Falls being formed by a crashed alien ship, the entire concept of the multiverse beyond Ford's portal and what he experienced over his 30 years away from Earth. These are explored, yes, but they don't take up more time than needed, and the information received through them is much more condensed. They serve as ways to make the story feel much more alive, with all of these different worlds and events and vaguely explained mysteries that create a world that's incredibly intriguing to analyze. When you look at it through these lens, Gravity Falls seems incredibly complex for a kid's show. The reason why so many people beg for a third season of the show is because they feel like there is so much more that can be done with this intricately layered world that they created so many more stories that could be told. However, that's not entirely necessary. The show is focused on telling a condensed, comprehensive, but still impactful narrative. They leave these details here as fun things to think about and theorize about, but they never let the main goal be clouded in a mess of complicated lore stuff, which is something that's really hard for a lot of shows to do when they go on for much longer to Gravity Falls. There's all this external lore stuff that can make getting into the show feel like a daunting task with a story that's intimidatingly dense. It can sometimes be plain irresistible for a writer to not explore these possible what-ifs, to add incredible amounts of context to a story with all these branching storylines and pieces of lore. Some people love that stuff. They love getting into a series that has a complicated story that makes sense when you piece it all together, and there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But sometimes when you have a clear goal in mind, and sometimes when you have a story that you want anyone to enjoy, Sometimes less is more, and Gravity Falls seems to understand that better than any show I've seen. There's only 40 episodes. 
two seasons. It's a perfectly condensed piece of entertainment and a pure triumph in television writing. Writing for television is very difficult. There's only so much you can do in 20 or 40 minutes compared to something like a feature length film. And you have to learn how to pace yourself in your storytelling. Maybe the show would have benefited from a third season. You can't say for sure, but I think it would have hurt the novelty of Gravity Falls' short but sweet runtime. It's a series with a clear beginning, middle, and end that you can watch roughly over the course of a weekend if you're committed enough. And the story it tells in that short length works and has its impact because you know that this story you're engaged with is not going to last forever. Let's actually talk about the content of this story I've been praising now. Season 1 is fairly straightforward. It's a season that mostly consists of the show's more slice of life -y episodes as they introduce plots and characters that will be brought up in future episodes, while giving Dipper and Mabel the sometimes terrifying but most enjoyable summer experiences of their lives, all the while solving the town's many mysteries. That is until the last two episodes of the season. From this point forward, the show becomes a lot more plot heavy, still having enough room for slice of life moments, but it's from here that the overarching story truly gets going. Episode 19, Dreamscapers, introduces Bill Cipher. No doubt, if you have not watched Gravity Falls, you have probably already been exposed to Bill in some capacity. He's regularly listed as one of Disney's greatest villains in recent memory, and it's fascinating because when you watch the show, he is barely around for about seven episodes out of 40. And this speaks volumes as to just how impactful he was that his presence was felt constantly throughout season 2, despite only showing up around two times before the finale. In Dreamscapers, we are finally given our first proper antagonist besides Gideon, who despite having some menace was still mainly a comic relief villain. Bill was delightfully odd, a shape-shifting psychopath with an instantly recognizable voice and design, and despite his playfulness, was always threatening whenever he was on screen. It's the fact that he's used sparingly that helps him retain that novelty. He is an all-powerful, all-knowing dream demon, and his plans for the future are briefly foreshadowed at the end of Dreamscapers. There's so much uncertainty and speculation that surrounds this character, and ultimately, the show's plot engagement lives and dies by his involvement, and you're left wondering when he'll show up again or what his plan is. He is an integral part of the show, and it would not be the same without him. Even if they had a different villain fill in the role, Bill's plan is to enact Weirdmageddon, an apocalypse event where Bill would inhabit a new dimension to escape his decaying one that he's been bound to for trillions of years. Gideon brings up how the way to bring about this apocalypse is through obtaining all the journals, and at the end of the episode, we see Stan is now in possession of all of them as he activates a portal below the mystery shack. For every answer you get in Gravity Falls, you receive another bundle of questions that leave you hooked for the rest of the season. It's a masterfully done setup and payoff, and it's always consistent. Season 2 charges into the story content with confidence, setting itself the huge task of solving every mystery the show has, tying up all of its loose ends. While it doesn't solve all of the questions, it provides answers for all all of the ones that matter and in satisfying fashion. What Gravity Falls really boils down to is setup and payoff, a storytelling fundamental that they managed to make seem effortless with their use of it. Season 2, episode 11, Not What He Seems, is far and away the show's best episode. It's an absolutely perfect culmination of what the show has been building up to thus far, and it works because you've seen these characters grow close over the course of the summer, you've watched them face supernatural entities, you've watched them overcome hardships and grow as people, and you've watched their mystery solving for a full season and a half. The the reason why Dipper and Mabel's upset confusion and frustration at their uncle for lying to them for so long, unsure of who he even really is or what he's been doing for the portal, the reason why this episode feels so tense and impactful, it's all because you've spent nearly a full summer watching them grow. These aren't just cartoon characters anymore, they're people real, believable people. The second half of season 2 introduces Stanford, Stanley's twin brother and the author of the journals. If there's one thing I'll criticize about Gravity Falls, it has to be Ford. Bill Cipher made sense of how he was used sparingly, but Ford is barely present which is a shame because he's one of my favorite characters. His backstory with Stan is heartbreaking and tragic and seeing them act distant from each other over their own mistakes is rough. And it also sets up the next part of Dipper and Mabel's arc, which I'll talk about more in another section of the video. The rest of the season is a race against time to stop Bill from enacting his plans, learning more about Ford's history with Bill along the way. When Weird Mageddon finally happens, it's the true culmination of everything that has happened thus far. Ties are mended, evil is stopped, and sacrifices are made. I don't want to go too in detail about the plot as it has been done many times before, but I want to stress just how good the show is at bringing closure and satisfaction to its story beats. Again, setup and payoff. The fact that a story of this scale can be told so well and with such precision over two seasons of television is frankly incredible. It tells a simple and easy to follow story while giving you a ton of food for thought. I'm not done discussing the plot if you think I'm wrapping this section up rather abruptly. It's important that I save the rest for later.
Take a shot whenever I say mystery in this video, by the way. The community that Gravity Falls created was unlike any other cartoon, and it was largely thanks to it being the perfect show to theorize about. Mystery is at the heart of Gravity Falls, and ever since the very first episode, it has been actively toying with us. It's not just talking about the times the show threw us a bone that led to a new answer and brought forth a plethora of other questions to discuss, but rather the more secrety side of it all. Gravity Falls is filled to the brim with secret codes and easter eggs in every episode, all of which helped keep the discussion of the show chugging along as they referenced future events, were small pieces of a much larger puzzle, or were simply just small jokes. I mean, come on, this was my first time ever being cucked by something. I was 10, Alex. Season 1 was mostly filled with little jokes, but Season 2 upped the ante by tenfold. Over the course of the series, fans slowly but surely began to crack at each individual code through figuring out which cipher they could be translated through. Most notably, the A1Z26 cipher, basically the English alphabet but substituting the right letter of the alphabet with its given numerical place, so A is 1 and Z is 26. The Caesar cipher, the alphabet but having its letter placements changed by a certain number, and the Atbash cipher, which is just the alphabet in reverse. However, there are plenty more ciphers like the author symbols found in Journal 3, the combined cipher, the visionaire cipher, which in season 2 would then be applied to the start of all the combined ciphers you could find, and then with the sheer number of hidden codes that decrypt throughout the series, it's... I, I sort of felt like I was back in 2014 for a second. It's been years since I've actually talked about this stuff. Oh, and also at the end of the show's intro, if you listen closely, you can hear someone whispering in reverse. This is actually different for every episode of the show, and whatever is whispered will give people a clue as to what cipher is needed to decrypt the code. God, it's so cool. Except for Weirdmageddon, their build just calls you a nerd. Gravity Falls actually has a few uses of backwards audio, but not all of them are code related. There was a tremendous amount of thought placed into each and every code in the show, even if it was just for a throwaway joke. But when you got those vague hints or cracked something cool, oh man, there was nothing quite like it. It was this level of engagement with the show's fans that led to the creation of such a devoted community. A lot of shows have pockets of theorizers going in depth on small details on the shows they love, but Gravity Falls was a case where the show actively embraced that side of its community and played along with them. You had legions of fans who, the second an episode aired, would run it back several times to catch anything they may have missed. There's a small sequence in Love God, for example, where a small message can be found over the course of a few seconds, and someone literally found it mere minutes after the episode came out. That was the kind of devotion you saw from the Gravity Falls fanbase. This kind of stuff isn't just limited to the show, either. Even in the shorts the show had in between seasons 1 and 2, and even in the damn books, there was this constant effort to keep fans on their toes for clues, even if the reward was just a nice message or a joke. It helped keep the show thriving during the downtime between episodes. And god did this show have some downtime when it was airing, holy crap it still hurts. I think it would be a disservice to not mention one of the most highly theorized aspects of the show. The Bill Cipher Wheel is shown for a single frame at the end of the intro for every episode. This is not only one of the show's most iconic visuals, but it also foreshadows the usage of the wheel as Bill's one true weakness that gets attempted use in the show's finale. But for years, people were trying to discern which symbol on the wheel represented each character after noticed that some were easy to spot, like Dipper being the pine tree, Mabel being the shooting star, and Stan being the crescent. It took years of theorizing because no one could actually hold on to a clear hypothesis as a few of the symbols didn't seem to be too literal. Until the finale came along and was like, yeah, you guys are dumb as hell, Wendy's the ice man cause she's cool as fuck. A big reason why the show has so many secret codes and is littered with mystery and intrigue is largely because of Alex Hertz's experiences as a kid. Dipper is based on Alex's memories and how it felt to be a kid. How he would record himself and play it backwards to try and learn how to speak backwards, carrying a bunch of cameras with him everywhere. You can see a lot of that in Dipper, and it helps that you as a viewer of the show are solving the mysteries of Gravity Falls along with the characters. It sells that feeling of being a kid and getting to uncover secrets that not many have stumbled across yet. If Gravity Falls was a straightforward show about stopping Bill Cipher's apocalypse, it wouldn't be compelling. Cracking codes, getting involved with each and every episode's plot and uncovering the secrets of the town that all leads up to an epic climax. You can clearly see how every moving part of the show works perfectly together in creating a satisfying experience. But more than that, the mysteries of the show and the theorizing that came with them are a part of its legacy, because there really hasn't been a show, let alone a cartoon, that's had this kind of culture around it. A community of nerds just getting a little more out of what was already a fantastic series, and having the show itself play into it all by putting so much effort into these codes and ciphers while leaving a vast majority of the solving up to the audience with very little hand-holding, you didn't just watch Gravity Falls, you were a part of it. And it makes me a little sad that people who watch the show in the future won't get the same experience as everyone else did as it was airing unless they actively avoid spoilers. 
Wars, which is pretty much impossible seeing as the show ended six years ago. But all of this mystery stuff brought an entire community together. All of this. All of this will forever be synonymous with the show, and it ensures that it won't be forgotten so easily. It's a testament to its legacy. But that's not all. When Wormageddon Part 3 aired and concluded the show, there was one last mystery to be solved, and this would take the show from being one of Disney's best cartoons to being one of the most respected and meticulously planned out TV shows ever made, 2016's famous Cypher Hunt. Now the Cypher Hunt has already been covered a lot, and there are a lot of great videos that go in depth on everything that happened, but it's a crucial thing for me to mention so I'll make this as brief as I can. At the end of Wormageddon Part 3, we receive a glimpse of what looks to be the statue of Bill Cypher that we see in the show after he's defeated, except this one was clearly filmed in live action and in an unknown area. People immediately began to theorize that the statue must be somewhere in real life for people to find. Radio silence from anyone involved with Gravity Falls until July 20th, 2016, where Alex Hirsch officially confirms that the statue exists somewhere and begins the hunt. Alex has stated that he wanted to give fans one final mystery to solve and wanted to do something that no show had ever done before, a worldwide treasure hunt. He attaches the following image and it doesn't take too long for it to be decoded, showing that people had not gotten rusty in the five months since the show ended and were ready for one final game. Using a negative free Caesar cipher and an at bash cipher, people decoded the red letters in the image as Russia. The middle left diagram was then identified as the Kazan Cathedral, where the next clue was found. This time hinting at Japan, mentioning a sword and crescent. Located at the Kanda Shrine in Tokyo, the next clue was found with a drawing of a sword and crescent along with an encrypted message that pointed to the next location being in Atlanta, Georgia, where a lost poster for Waddles was found along with a cryptogram and a phone number to call if Waddles was found. This phone number would be a reversed message from Grunkle Stan, who revealed the next clue was in a course of a university in Rhode Island. It's, um, it's like a like a big old building in Rhode Island, and you go up some stairs, and there's gonna be a bunch of pictures of nuns on the wall. You gotta look behind one of the nun pictures. Sister Mary Hilda Miley, real. But it was disposed before the hunt began on accident, so I can imagine Alex was just a little stressed out that half a year of work was thrown off track, but it was substituted for a new clue after he tweeted out a phone number containing a new message from Stan, revealing the next clue to be in Los Angeles where a golden Stan head was found with an encoded message written in invisible ink. Yeah, they were really pulling out all the stops for this hunt. Seriously, every single skill used to solve the show's mysteries was being used to great effect here. It's insanely impressive that this was executed as well as it was, and it's why I think it's good to mention. All of these skills that have been built out throughout the years are now being put to good use for one final reward. Anyway, the message was decoded pointing to Century City where fans were unexpectedly joined by Jason Ritter, the voice of Dipper Pines, and Ariel Hirsch, Alex's sister. Together they found a black pouch containing a USB stick with an audio file directly mentioning the location of the next clue, while also featuring the ghost of Sister Mary Hilda Miley taunting Grunkle Stan about not finding the treasure after the university disposed of the original four. Zeus, get the vacuum cleaner! Yes, sir, Mr. Pines. No! My one weakness! A creative solution! I'll be back! You'll never find the treasure! Good job, Zeus. Have a chicken nugget. Anyway, the next clue was located at Cal Arts, where crudely drawn graffiti of Bill Cipher on a wall was found, which contained a series of hexadecimal and decimal codes. When decrypted, the next clue pointed to Piedmont, California, where a small chest was found and unlocked using the word pines. The next two clues are actually closely linked. The eighth clue was located at a USPS post office in Los Angeles, a key which opened a P.O. box that contained a gigantic 2,000-piece jigsaw puzzle and a bunch of stand bucks with the word Philbrick written on the back in invisible ink. This puzzle took several days to complete, with many spending bloody night shifts on it. Because the puzzle took much longer than expected, because Alex Hirsch is the devil incarnate, Hirsch took to Twitter so that people could digitally solve the puzzle using Photoshop, where after a few hours, the message on the puzzle was decoded. But while all of this was happening, and the physical puzzle was still being put together, Someone just found the ninth clue by complete accident. In Portland, Oregon, someone who had been keeping up with the hunt on Twitter just came across a garden gnome like the one featured on the puzzle, and found a viewmaster along with the ninth clue written on a piece of paper. You cannot write this stuff if you tried. With this essentially rendering the puzzle obsolete as a clue, Alex decided to give a reward for those who stuck through it and finished it. He promised that he would release the unaired pilot of Gravity Falls made back in 2010. The puzzle was then completed by the 1st of August, where Alex came to greet everyone in person to congratulate them. 
and promised there that he would release the unaired pilot. Jesus, this man is good at improvising when shit hits the fan. I'm actually really jealous. The Viewmaster from the Ninth Clue had slides of the area around Confusion Hill, a real life tourist trap evocative of Gravity Falls of Mystery Shack, where using the word written on the back of the stand box, an eyeball jar could be retrieved, the tenth clue written on the bottom. In Amity, Oregon, Fallon's found a geocache bolt of the eleventh clue inside, leading to the final clue in Turner, Oregon at the Enchanted Forest Amusement Park. And despite one family finding a message reading, Here lies the bones of a man named Bill, the clue itself was taken by a fan already who then uploaded the image of the final clue online. And with the message decoded, it says to return to where it all began, and the answer is written in the trees, with the back of the clue containing a map and was actually a ripped off piece of the original cipher hunt image. After a few days of confusion, Alex gave a tip to the hunters and revealed that a Polybius square was required to find where Bill was located, as well as finding a pattern in the trees that could be converted to numbers. Are you still with me? The branches and knots of the trees were decoded to read sport or, which based on the assumption the last letters had to be an abbreviation for Oregon, the location of the statue was found at Reed Sport, Oregon, with the statue being found on the 2nd of August, with it containing a treasure chest full of goodies and a USB drive. The drive contained a text document which seemingly did a little bit of trolling until opening it in Notepad gave the word return backwards to the past again free, which when entered as a username and password on the mystery of gravityfalls.com slash pilots, finally gave viewers access to the unaired of Gravity Falls pilot, the final reward for a lengthy treasure hunt. This was mainly me listing the stuff that happened and I recommend watching other videos that go more in depth because there was some crazy clever stuff done for this hunt, but this hunt was much more than a simple fan event. This was the culmination of years of hard work to reward the fans who had stuck by the show itself until the very end. It made use of everything that made code cracking and Gravity Falls special, and stretched the minds of fans to their absolute limits. The Cypher Hunt is legendary for a reason. No show has ever done an ARG quite this elaborate. It was a special experience for spectators, participants, and for fans across the world, and it will forever be a part of a legacy that no Disney show, regardless of quality, can come close to. A perfect end to a show about mystery and secrets. At its heart, Gravity Falls is a series that preaches two things above all else. Growing up is difficult, but inevitable. But growing up doesn't mean you have to let go. The show was conceived as a finite series about one epic summer, with Alex Hertz going on record saying that there are so many shows that go on endlessly until they lose their original spark, or mysteries that are cancelled before they ever get a chance to pay off. Gravity Falls being such a short but tightly written series with an actual conclusion was highly experimental, especially for a show that aired on a Disney network where shows live and die based on unexpected renewals and, more often than not, outright cancellations. It's a miracle that Disney was as supportive as they were with letting Hurch end the series on his own terms, considering how successful the show was. But this creative decision not only helped the writing and story since there was no worry of a cancellation so they could take more time with making the writing more precise, it also emphasized the key theme the show was always built around and made the series short length all the more impactful. Dipper and Mabel began the series at the tail end of their tweens. They are a mere three months away from turning 13 and having to face growing up as teenagers. It's a fact that stares the both of them in the face as they spend the last summer of their childhood, so to speak, at Gravity Falls. Gravity Falls itself represents the best aspects of Dipper and Mabel's childhoods that they fully embrace. It's a period of time that forever changes them, gives them the opportunities to live out their wildest fantasies, to make new friends, to uncover secrets and facing supernatural evils. It's one crazy, chaotic, but ultimately fun summer, with the dreamy scenarios they face being mixed together with sweet summer nostalgia. When removing the supernatural aspect, the summer is still filled with as many pleasant and resonant memories that you yourself as a viewer could have similar experiences doing. Fishing with your older relatives, going to the pool, doing dumb stuff with friends. It's also evocative of childhood while facing certain issues like having a crush, going through puberty, stuff like that. Gravity Falls is the final hurrah of Dipper and Mabel's youth, and no matter how much fun they have, they live in constant reminder of this. We're getting older, there's not that many Halloweens left. Guess I didn't realize it was already our last one. Nah, nobody likes getting older, but just because you're growing up doesn't mean you have to grow up, you know? I wish summer could last forever. Things aren't gonna stay frozen this way. It's part of growing up. Things change. Summer ends. 
A lot of people seem to be incredibly harsh on Mabel for her reaction to Dipper taking Ford's apprenticeship and denying reality while refusing to grow up. Though I do believe that they should have executed the reality that Bill created for her a lot better so she came off as less self-centered. I never hated her for this. Dipper and Mabel vs. the Future is one of my favorite episodes of the show, because to put it simply, it's relatable to a fault. Mabel spends the episode having her plans for her 13th birthday crushed, knowing her friends can't make it, has her dreams and perception of growing up crushed over knowing what high school could be like, and at the end of the episode, after hearing about Dipper taking Ford's apprenticeship, she realizes that as she leaves behind the best days of her childhood, she's also losing her brother and closest friend. It's a build-up of emotions that a lot of people can relate to. The entire episode drives home the fear many people had over growing up as a kid. Weird Mageddon Part 2 takes place entirely within the reality Bill concocted to grant Mabel her one true desire, to live in a constant state of summer that never ends, with Mabel eventually rejecting the reality with Dipper's help, with him swearing that whatever comes their way in life, they'll face it together like they always have, and that she doesn't have to fear growing up on her own. And all of this culminates in the show's finale, Weird Mageddon Part 3. Well, on a surface level, it's clear that Dipper and Mabel are working together with everyone they've met over the course of the summer to save Gravity Falls from Bill's clutches, it's also clear that it's their way of safeguarding their childhood and shows just how much this town has changed them and what it means to them. And after the fighting is done, we come to the final scene. The last bus leaving Gravity Falls arrives and the twins say goodbye as they leave town to face the unknown future ahead of them. However, not without a little reminder. The significance of this note cements the message that growing up doesn't mean you have to let go. What made Gravity Falls so emotionally engaging for so many was not just because of the story and characters but because it was like saying goodbye to their childhood for the second time. The show is built on memories of childhood. The characters face relatable struggles that others face at around the same age, and experiencing this big, crazy summer of these characters allows you to relive those years and look fondly on them. And just like the summer itself, you forget how short it really is, and it's hard to accept that your time in Gravity Falls will be over soon. But watching these characters face the difficulties of growing up and the fear of change, the ending of the summer, and having them basically tell the audience that it's okay, it's a part of life, but you don't have to let go of things as you age. Despite being a simple message on the surface, it is one that is executed with four years worth of sincerity and has an impact on all who watch it, kids and adults. It's no wonder then why so many people, grown adults even, found themselves tearing up as the bus finally drove into the horizon, leaving Gravity Falls. Hell, re-watching the show for this video, I still cried at the ending. Speaking for myself here, I was watching the show from age 10 to 12, starting in 2014 and ending in 2016 with the finale. I was at just the right age for the ending to have an impact on me after going out of my way to watch every single episode, getting involved with its community and solving the mysteries, cracking codes, theorizing about where the story would go, what would happen when it all ended, and what I would do when it ended. I think a large portion of the fanbase are indeed adults given the wide generational appeal of the series, and I think a lot of people don't really think about what it was like to be a kid while watching it. I was around the same age as Dipper and Mabel as they were growing up. I too had fears of going to high school, fears about my future, fears about growing up. I had people left and right telling me that I was too old for things that I enjoyed, like cartoons and comics and other things I would hyperfixate on. And I'm not really sure I understood what growing up meant. Gravity Falls was the perfect show for me to be engaged with at the time. The weight of its already emotional ending made the way it taught its message that much more memorable and impactful. It's one thing to just teach kids something important about life, but backed up with good storytelling that you remain engaged with for years on end? That's how you allow a piece of entertainment to communicate its core message naturally over time. Time. And I think it's safe to say that I certainly grew up, going on 18 in about a month from when this video is published, but I never let go of the things I loved and the things I loved doing. Well, obviously some of them, but I kept a good majority of my hobbies over time and in some ways allowed them to develop into something more mature like making reviews, collecting stuff, etc etc. My love for this series has never been a secret. It's sometimes been apparent that it's negatively affected my bias as a critic when looking at stuff like Amphibia and The Owl House, two really, really good shows that I originally didn't give the fairest chance. I guess that stuff just changes as you grow up, you mellow out, but I always held on to what I loved. And in all in all, that's why, after 10 long years since it first aired and a good 8 since I first fell in love with it, I'll never let go of my love for Gravity Falls.